Welcome back to Your Brain, a personal tour. This is Steve Saltwick. Today's seminar is about the structure of memory. Now, memory is a slippery term. Some people use it one way, some people use it a different way. For today, we'll use a definition of memory, which is, it is the storage and retrieval of knowledge about the world that changes our behavior. We'll look at memory in three different aspects. First, what are the critical parts of the brain that store memory? Second, do memories move around in your brain? Maybe one part of your brain early on in your experience and a different part of the brain later in your experiment experience? And then lastly, can we manipulate memory to relieve human suffering? My one sentence summary of this seminar is that the rich episodic memories like Proust wrote about eventually become totem poles as the Pacific Northwest Indians carved. But the totem poles are in your brain. How does that work? Well, welcome to the seminar and let's find out. Now, I want to return to the road less travel metaphor we used last time. Seminar two was about how your brain decides to act, how to choose a road in the woods. Seminar three, today, is about how your brain remembers what you chose. Now, I've added two more books to the reading list. They are excellent resources for future study. However, they are academic publications, which mean they can be at high prices. So be sure to evaluate used or paperback editions or Kindle offerings, etc. Now, are we ready to begin? Well, then let's go. Ma chambre a la forme d'une cage. Le soleil passe son bras par la fenêtre. Les chasseurs à ma porte comme les petits soldats qui veulent me prendre. Now, memories can be verbal or nonverbal. In some memories, we can be in a proof story, a rich, detailed recollection of events, perhaps long past. Or in another memory, we might be in a Pacific Northwest Indian totem pole story. The memory, the memory reflects the gist of the story, as it's re recreated anew with each telling or remembrance. A good example for the totem pole memory or story is the Goldilocks. It would have a bear and a bowl and a bed. A knowledgeable storyteller, your brain, would recreate the story from these mnemonics. But there's a third kind of memory, and this memory is not verbal at all. It is a change in brain structure that encodes an interaction with the world such that the behavior is different on that interaction. Look at this field. This field has previously interacted with water, which resulted in a gully. Future interactions with water in this field will behave very differently because of this gully. This is a memory not involving words, but of a change in structure of the environment. I want to begin our discussion of memory with a personal encounter. This is me about to undergo my second hip operation. I'm accompanied by the brilliant surgeon, Dr. Selby Carter. My first operation was extremely successful. I just couldn't wait to have my second hip operation, to fully enjoy the benefits of having a new hip and an old body. But this picture almost didn't happen, because a few days earlier, I had the following conversation with my wife, Becky. I was sitting at the breakfast table, drinking coffee, when Becky entered our kitchen, returning from work. She said, why aren't you at the doctor's office? I said, what doctor's office? Becky said, to prepare for surgery. I said, what surgery? Becky said, now getting a little concerned for your other hip. Time to do the right hip. I said, I've never had hip surgery. Becky, now getting really concerned, goes, yes, you did in March of 2014. I was very frustrated now, and I said, no, I didn't. In fact, if I had hip surgery, then I would have a scar. I then proceeded to show her how I had no scar, at which point I said, oh no, I have a scar. Then Becky goes, let's take a little car ride. She didn't tell me where we were going to the emergency room, but that's where we went. 
As we drove, it became clear that there were some things that were not quite working with my memory. I did not remember going to India six months before, and forgetting something within six months of this episode is significant. However, I did remember Becky and the dogs. I could remember the layout of our home of 20 years. I knew where to go find my shoes. I remembered how to put my seat belt on. I remembered the habits that one normally has. I could ask reasonable questions. For example, I knew that if I had a hip hip surgery, then I'd have a scar. So I could do deductive reasoning. But I had a big problem. And that problem was illustrated with the following dialogue we had as we drove to the emergency room. Becky would ask, how are you doing? And I would say, I had hip surgery? Yep, three months ago. Where, where are we going? I, I had hip surgery? Yes, look at your scar. Really, really, you're sure that I had hip surgery? Yes, you had hip surgery. Where are we going again? This conversation shows that I was looping. I could not incorporate the context of what was happening right now into my memory. I could focus on it for a little while, but then distracted, or if I looked at something else, I'd re- I would return to a fact I just could not represent, that I had had hip surgery. This leads us to look in some very specific places to where my problem lay. The good news was, after 24 hours of tests against my body, my brain, my heart, my blood flow, my everything, I got a diagnosis, and then right after that, I got a new hip. And boy, was I happy to have those two hips. But what the heck happened in my brain? I had most likely an interruption of blood flow from the internal jugular vein to that old friend of ours, the hippocampus. That interruption of blood flow acted as a reset. In essence, the interruption of the blood flow caused my hippocampus to reboot. The medical condition is called transient global amnesia, or TGA for short. Um, My hippocampus had to restart, and as a function of that restarting, I had the memory episode. We'll use this story to set our framework for the seminar today. Why did a a hiccup in my hippocampus result in a failure to retrieve memories? Why does it make me clang over and over and over again, looping on, you know, a particular point? I will probably never recover the memory of the four to six hours of actual episode, but soon thereafter, all the other memories, India, etc., came back. What's going on here? Now, if you talk about memory, there's a specific animal that springs to mind, the elephant. Legendary for their memory, it does turn out that elephants have a hippocampus 40% bigger than the human hippocampus, prorated for body weight. It also turns out that elephants have one of the most complex societies on the planet. They comfort others, they perform death rituals, and they honor their elders. I wish more humans did that. The association of the hippocampus with a complex society is the first hint that there might be something more to the hippocampus than we studied in the previous seminar. And that's important. But there's another good, there's another good reason to be aware of the elephant and the hippocampus. Elephants are only distantly related to human. Our family tree diverged about 60 million years ago. Elephants are most closely related to manatees. So if elephants and manatees have a hippocampus, then all uh, hippocampus should, you know, the, the hippocampus should be fundamental as a building block for memory for virtually all mammals. We can learn a lot from studying how the hippocampus works in such widely diverse species, if we can keep them around. And help for keeping them around is one fortuitous outcome of research on elephants. Nowadays, poaching is not the most pressing danger for elephants. Competition for forage with native farmers is the new challenge. Farmers often kill elephant trespassers on their field. I'm thrilled to note that as a result of some practical scientific research, it's been shown that elephants are truly scared of only two things, humans and bees. Bees can sting the end of their trunk, and that makes even a bull elephant cower. As a result of this research, enterprising farmers are now constructing low-cost bee fences. Hives are hung between poles with two outstanding results. Everyone can afford to protect their field without killing elephants, and collected honey can be used for food and or a cash crop at the market. 
If that's not a win-win, I don't know what is. Recall we looked at the hippocampus and found there were unique neurons within the hippocampus called place cells. Those cells fired when an animal was at a particular point of space. Well, it turns out that the hippocampus is much more than place cells. We'll look at that in this section of the seminar. To make a long story short, the hippocampus is essential for what is called episodic memory. Examples of episodic memory are, do you remember where you were and what you were doing at the time of 9-11? Where you were and who you were with when you heard of the assassination of John F. Kennedy or when Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon? These are autobiographical memories, almost like a Proust story, and they are rich. They are detailed. We remember them vividly. It turns out the hippocampus is essential for this kind of memory. Now, episodic memory is not a YouTube video of the events of the day. The hippocampus seems to thread time and space into a personal fabric of experiment, experience involving you at the center, and then the what, where, when aspects fused uh, into your experience in a unique way. While machines are used to measure linear time, see the clock in the middle of the diagram on the right, our brain experiences time as an ordering of events. In other words, I went skiing downhill, I then trudged up the hill, I had to, snubble, I had to shovel snow, and then I built a fire. The metrics of this experience are far more complicated than the picture I present. In fact, we're just starting to understand the experience in detail. But we do understand the basic points, and that's what I'm going to present today. Now, I want to refresh your memory about place cells and how they relate to a rat thinking. When a rat runs in a familiar maze, he goes through a series of spatial locations. Those locations are coded in the hippocampus by different place cells. A place cell fires when the rat is in the purple zone, a different place cell fires for the yellow zone, a different one for the red zone, etc., etc., all the way through the maze as he runs it. But there's another time the place cells fire, sharp wave ripples, or SWRs for short. A sharp wave ripple is a very quick burst of place cells, about a tenth of a second, far too fast for movement. And place cells, and those place cells are firing in sequence. So in essence, when a sharp wave ripple occurs, the rat is thinking about a path. He's not moving in that path. That happen this happens much too quickly. The rat is thinking about going on a path. That path can be described by the sequence of place cells as they fire. On the bottom, a sequence of color-coded place cells within the short wave ripple decode the trajectory of the maze. Go purple, blue, green, yellow, orange, red. And that takes the rat through the maze. Fantastic. But, and this is the big but, it turns out that's not the only way that hippocampal cells fire in a sharp wave ripple. For example, let's take a rat that's been trained to go through a maze to obtain a food reward. If we look at sharp wave ripples when the rat begins, we would see the firing of place cells that anticipate the path the rat is about to run. In other words, we can predict the path the rat will take to the food. But once the rat gets to the food and starts to consume, we, something, we see something very different. The place cells fire in the reverse order. It's as if the rat is thinking, how did I get here? That's probably a good thing to remember. The reward system is going to be active when the rat is consuming the food, so at the time the reward system is active, place cells are firing in re reverse order in the sharp wave ripples. Basically, they're laying down a path that this food, you know, uh, the path to this food, which will be strengthened by rewards. This mechanism is what underpins the deliberative learning we studied last seminar. This mechanism is very, very important. Place cells within sharp wave ripples show what is about to happen in terms of the behavior of an animal, and they also explain how an animal learns when they discover a reward. And sharp wave ripples could help the animal for a memory of what happened. Is that true in humans? I mean, do we think like a rat? Well, you've heard me say it more than once. Yes, you think like a rat. There is recent research that shows this clearly. Here, patients undergoing surgery for epilepsy were shown pictures while they were on an operating table. Recall the violinist? There's no pain receptors in the brain, so, you know, recording from the brain uh, is, you know, absolutely safe. 
they were also asked to freely recall the pictures they were shown. In other words, they you know, were asked to report out any picture they remember without an explicit prompting on which picture, etc. There were three major findings. First, stronger rates of sharp wave riffles were associated with stronger memories. You know, high rates of strong rate of ripples meant high rates of recall. Second, a sharp wave ripple usually preceded the recall of a picture. In other words, the retrieval of a memory was preceded by a sharp wave ripple. And finally, the sharp wave ripple in a free recall activated other areas of the brain in a pattern or pattern similar to what you know, those areas of the brain were active when the picture was actually viewed. In other words, the sharp wave ripple brought forth brain patterns in recall that were like the patterns which occurred in actual perception. The patients were, in a sense, seeing the object during recall, all driven by a sharp wave ripple. Wow, the sharp wave ripple dudes are really, really important in memory. But wait, there's more. It turns out that play cells also measure time. Let's train a rat to run on a treadmill for varying lengths of time. If we look at the hippocampus, we'll find cells that measure time, much as other play cells measure space. Look in the section of this diagram where we see four hippocampal cells, A, B, C, and D. The activities of these cells seem to measure the time interval as the rat runs on a treadmill. Cell A marks the beginning of this time interval, cell B the next, then cell C, and then cell D marks the end. We show three separate runs on the treadmill, so there's three rows to each tracing. The experimenters were quite careful to run control tests to ensure the hippocampal cell activity did not merely measure the level of effort or how many footsteps or paw steps a rat had done. The activity of these cells was a measure of time. But before we can sell, say what place cells really are, we need to look at one more aspect. It turns out that hippocampal place cells can be social and track the position of others. The coolest way I've found to show this is, is with an experiment with bats. Somehow, the experimenters invented a way to record from bat hippocampal place cells while the bats were flying. So the cells were active at, you know, were active not at the level of a maze, but when the bat was flying at a particular point in three-dimensional space. The experiment used a demonstrator-observer paradigm. In this type of experiment, an observer bat watches a demonstrator bat fly to one of two positions. After the demonstrator flies to a particular pole, say A, the observer bat is supposed to follow. After training, not only were the hippocampal place cells found in the observer bat, which represented the bat's own position in space, but other place, social place cells were found to represent demonstrator bat's position in space. So if you're confused why I'm calling cells that can detect space, time, learning, and social elements place cells, it's understandable. Let's get a better name. Hippocampal cells certainly represent a lot more than place. What they really do is build a context. Now, what do I mean by a context? Well, let's take a familiar example. In an office, there's many different kinds of elements. There's chairs, a desk, filing cabinet, a clock, might be papers. All of these things are individually perceivable objects. They're found in many different experiences. Amazon web pages, Costco, Office Depot, what have you. In an office context, there's an integrated whole of them in a particular place at a particular time. So your office is a particular desk with a particular filing cabinet, a particular chair, a particular clock, particular papers, all integrated into a perceptual whole. That's what I mean by a context. This context has all the details of a Proust story. It's rich. You can imagine yourself within that context. The essential function of the hippocampus is to encode space, time, learning, and social variables into such a context. Since that context can be used to affect behavior, <clears throat> which is our definition of memory, there's at least one type of memory processed and held by the hippocampus. Once context cells are built in your hippocampus, they can be associated with other experiences. 
if you have an aversive experience in that office, let's say a confrontation with an office worker, then that office context can be associated with that averse experience as if it's Pavlovian or associative conditioning. An interesting aspect of context cells is that their response can be evoked by just a part of that context. This is called pattern completion. When you remember or experience just a portion of the office, all the other memories associated with that office can be called to the fore of your brain. The presence of the office can bring forth an aversive emotional response even with the person absent. The context is being completed by the hippocampus into the whole office, including the memory of the aversive experience. Now, a good way to think about the action of the hippocampus is that it helps your brain create a movie of the experience. It's trying together who, what, where, when of the experience. The movie is centered around your experience. However, the movie is a special movie. Your experiences are abstracted into shareable units of knowledge. Let's take an example, a meal. In a typical American meal, you might experience a sequence like this, an appetizer followed by a main course, then a dessert, well, you know, why not? And then coffee, not tea. What your brain does is not only to make a movie about it, it abstracts the experience into units of knowledge that represent key dimensions of each stage. Appetizers are small, often shared and savory, in other words, not sweet. Mains are large, especially in America, not shared and varied. Desserts are small, often too small, often shared and sweet. And finally, since I'm an exclusive coffee drinker, the final course is coffee, not tea. Recall the seminar title, I said this is my personal tour. Before we close this section, I want to return to the fundamental importance of space and place in the operation of the hippocampus. Yes, the hippocampus re reacts to far more than just GPS position. I mean, for example, time or learning or social factors. But how are they organized? Well, the most recent research would say a cognitive map. In this view, the context is really a map of your sequential experiences in that context. Let's take a simple view from a rat's perspective. The rat explores a cage with various colored walls and objects. It is proposed that the hippocampus is building not only a movie of the sequential experience, you know, walk past a red wall, walk past a red wall, walk to where the red wall meets the black wall, turn, encounter the light blue object, hit the dark blue wall, the rap is building a model of the environment. It is building a context, shown in the panel as a map. This is right in line with how our sensory systems build an object in the act of perception. Now, this is an exciting theory, and it'll be fascinating to see how future studies advance our knowledge. Let's hear from Homer. The first thing Homer would like to say is, Wow, play cells are really context cells, not only for perception of context, but also for the memory of context. Many of the same cells that perceive a context are the ones that are associated with the memory of context. The second thing Homer says is his brain makes a movie about experiences to help in the formation of such a memory for the experience. Now, knowing what we know about how context cells work in the hippocampus, let's revisit what was happening in my hippocampus. When I had my transient global amnesia, one significant fact was I couldn't incorporate things that were happening to me into the context of the current time. I had no recollection of hip surgery, and even though I was told that I had hip surgery, even though I you know, saw my scar, I just could not incorporate that into the context of what was happening now. I also couldn't remember that I'd been to India with Becky six months prior. However, I did remember Becky. I did remember the dogs. I did remember the layout of our house. So I clearly had some memories, which I could still get to, even during a restart of my hippocampus. Now, a few weeks later, I could access the memories of India again. So some memories were not, you know, just in my hippocampus. The question is, where well, were they? The answer to that question means we have to look at dreaming and sleep. 
Now in The Tempest, Shakespeare says, we are such stuff as dreams are made, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Shakespeare got it right. The creation of memories depend upon sleep. Human life would be impossible without sleep. Your brain needs sleep, and we're now going to talk about this in this section. Dreaming is an activity of your brain during sleep. It's not essential. Certain antipsychotic drugs eliminate dreaming, yet, st yet people still live healthy lives. But dreaming is something that has fascinated man for as long as history has existed, and we need to talk about it in our search for memories. Sleep is divided into two main categories as shown on this diagram. There's something called non-rapid eye movement sleep, or NREM, and something called rapid eye movement sleep, or REM. The various stages of sleep within these categories are shown on the left. Sensation and perception varies across these modes of sleep. Most people think that dreaming only occurs in REM sleep, and until quite recently that was supported by the output of the research literature. But as it turns out so often with research, the result you get depends on the question you ask. If you ask people going into the first stage of non-REM sleep anything going through your mind, you will get a dream report 80 to 90 percent of the time. If you wake people up at a stage of deep sleep, there's something called sleep inertia, and it has a major effect on dream reports. People awakening from this stage of sleep need time to reorient and get back up to speed on what is happening in the now. Dream reports are very unlikely at this point in time. But if you sum over all the stages of non-REM sleep, dreaming is reported when you ask the right question between 25 and 75 percent of the time. Clearly, we dream in many stages of sleep. Now, if you look at rapid eye movement sleep, it turns out that the vast majority of rapid eye movement sleep occurs in the womb. A baby before birth will spend up to 24 hours a day in rapid eye movement sleep. That sleep percentage declines over time, becoming almost vestigial once we've reached adulthood. A fascinating theory of REM sleep function, at least in the womb, is that during REM, a pattern generator in the brain causes the baby's limbs to move. That movement then feeds back via somatosensory input into the brain and helps various parts of the brain wire together. This pattern generator doesn't go away as we age, so there's still bits of our sleep where the pattern generator is generating movements, and that may cause our body to move, and it may be what causes active lucid dreaming. One thing that sleep has unambiguously been related to is the reduction of synapses between brain cells. Recall from our previous lecture that a synapse is where two brain cells communicate. It's highlighted on the left in the red circle. A synapse is essential to learning. New ones grow as we make new memories. But wait, brains are typically in skulls of a fixed volume. If you make new synapses every time you make a new memory, won't we run out of room eventually? Yep, we will. So how does Mother Nature address that? Sleep. Sleep reduces the number of synapses in your brain. In essence, sleep helps you forget. Research confirms that this happens in a wide variety of animals, as diverse as fruit flies on top and mice on the bottom. Actual micrographic photographs of synapse reduction are shown on the left for each one of the species. There seems to be a total, a kind of grand total, uh, that is kind of a maximum number of synapses the brain can have. Sleep reduces the net number of synapses in your brain to relieve the pressure of daily learning. Now, that's an interesting fact, but there's an even more interesting fact that can be discovered about the structure of memory in your brain, and we're going to look at that next. The first fact we want to note is that sharp wave ripples are repeated in certain phases of sleep, slow wave sleep and others. On the left-hand bottom of this slide, we show a familiar diagram that represents a sharp wave ripple, a sequential firing of place cells, decoding a path in space. Sharp wave ripples also occur during certain phases of sleep, and that's shown on the right. Sleep is divided into several stages, but for our discussion right now, we only need to really be concerned with two major divisions. Sleep that occurs in the first of a nightly rest period, you know, virtually all mammals, this is called slow wave sleep or non-rapid eye movement sleep. And then in the second phase of sleep is called rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep. 
Sharp wave ripples occur in slow wave sleep. We can see that on the rat EEG, and we can also see that in human brain EEG. In humans, sharp wave ripples are called spindles sometimes in the medical literature. Sorry about the terminology mess, but they're the same thing. Note, we see representations of thoughts being repeated in sleep. I'll have a further slide on this in just a minute. But maybe that might keep these thoughts from being forgotten as a result of synaptic reduction. And further, if those electrical patterns are related to the formation of memories, we should be able to manipulate them. And we'll see that we can later on in this seminar. To show this manipulation, let's set up an experiment. Our goal is going to be to create a memory. Because if we can, then we can better understand the brain processes that underlie it. First, we're going to take a rat and we're going to put an electrode in his hippocampus. We're going to record place cell activities and sharp wave ripples. We're also going to put an electrode into the reward system. Remember, we dealt with the reward system in seminar two. By stimulating the reward system, we can behave as if we fed the animal some food or given him some kind of positive reinforcer. So we have two electrodes, one to monitor what's going on in the hippocampus and the other to activate the reward system. Now we have a computer in control of all of this, so when the computer detects a sharp wave ripple, it can stimulate the reward system. Prior to training, we put the rat into a circular enclosure and let him wander around. We find a place cell. In this instance, the place cell is shown on the heat map of activity. The area shown in red, that's where the place cell is most active. We're now going to let the rat go to sleep, and we're going to monitor his hippocampus. When the place cell fires, when that place cell fires, we're going to stimulate the reward system. Now note, in this phase, the rat is asleep. He's not moving around. It's as if he's dreaming about moving around. And whenever he dreams that he is in the location represented by this place cell, we're going to stimulate the reward system. After the rat wakes up, we're going to put him back in the environment, and lo and behold, the rat makes a beeline for that area of the maze associated with the place cell. Amazing. We have created a memory. The rat never experienced food or any other reinforcer in that place. We've done all of this electronically. We've monitored the place cell of the hippocampus, stimulated the reward system whenever the place cell fired during sleep, so if we can create memories by pairing sharp wave ripples in the hippocampus with stimulation of the reward system, can we do the opposite? Can we disrupt learning and memory by disrupting sharp wave ripples? And it turns out we can. The experimental apparatus is shown on the left-hand side. There's an eight-arm maze. A rat is always put into the middle of the maze to start. Three out of the eight arms are baited with food, and those are shown by the small red dots at the end of the arms. Each day, we give the rat three training sessions. He's placed in the center. He gets to explore, find three places of food. He then gets three trials a day. There's a three-minute rest between each trial, and then at the end of three trials, there's a one-hour sleep rest period. During that sleep rest period, we're going to monitor for sharp wave ripples, and whenever we see one, for, you know, for the test group of rats, we're going to disrupt them by zapping the hippocampus. Now, in a control group, we'll zap, you know, the hippocampus any, the same number of times, but we'll do the randomly with respect to sharp wave ripples. Another control group of rats will not be implanted or zapped just to provide a baseline activity for the test. We'll train the, da the rats day by day by day, and the results are shown on the right. We see that our control animals learn this task to a very high level of performance, greater than 90% over the course of 15 days. The control group, which had random stimulation of the hippocampus, learned just as well as the implanted group. They're just normal rats. However, look at the test group. They're shown in red. The test group had a severe impairment on this task. By disrupting sharp wave ripples in the hippocampus, we are disrupting learning. We are disrupting memory. So we can manipulate memory. We can actually create them, and we can actually disrupt them by manipulating sharp wave ripples in the hippocampus of a rat. Now, I know, I know, I keep talking about rats. You know, are there some experiments with humans? Yes. And this one gives some fascinating information about memories and sleep. So participants were awakened 12 times throughout the night. You know, it's tough to be in a sleep experiment. At each point in the night, participants reported any dream. 
In the morning, participants identified and dated potential sources for that dream. A clear pattern emerged. Recent memories that have, you know, affected dreams early in the part of the night and remote memories, memories that happened further away in time, were reflected in dreams late in the night. There were primarily two stages of sleep where dreams reported, one in non-REM sleep and one in REM sleep. Your brain seems to be acting differently on recent memories compared to remote memories. And I believe that's an indication of how they move around in your brain. Let's take a look. So now we're ready to explore how memories move around and how they are changed in our brain as a function of sleep. The bottom line here is that sleep produces memory totem poles. Remember totem poles represent the essence of a story. They're the distilled elements separate from all the autobiographical stuff. In this section, we'll see how sleep produces memory like totem poles as those memories move outside of the hippocampus. A good experimental protocol to show the movement of memories is the social transmission of food preference. Now that's a mouthful, but it makes a lot of sense if you think about it from a rat's perspective. In this kind of experiment, we take two rats, one's called an observer and the other one is called a demonstrator, kind of like the bats, right? And we ensure they trust one another, if you will, by having them share a meal. They eat some well-known food, like rat chow, together. After that, the rats are separated. The observer goes away into a completely different room. The demonstrator is then given some uniquely flavored food. Turns out that rats love cinnamon on their rat chow. After the demonstrator has eaten the cinnamon, we bring the observer rat back together with the demonstrator and they socially interact. When rats do that, they smell each other's breath. After that reunion, we, re we present the observer rat a food choice. One choice is the cinnamon, which the demonstrator rat has eaten and that the observer rat has smelled on his breath. And the other choice is cocoa rat chow, which neither rat has eaten. When presented with this choice, the observer shows an incredible preference for the cinnamon flavored food. Now this makes a lot of sense. If you smell a unique food on the breath of one of your rat pals and he's not dead, well, that's probably a pretty good food to eat and a good memory to have. Now let's track the development and movement of such a memory over time. In this instance, we're going to use cumin as the unique taste. After the demonstrator observer reunion and food fest, we study the rat <clears throat> over the course of about a month. The rat is allowed to sleep on its normal sleep-wake pattern. We're going to see which areas of the brain are involved over the course of time. And what we find is, early, say in the first couple of weeks, there's an interaction between the hippocampus and the frontal cortex of the brain. There's a synchronization, if you will, between the hippocampus and the frontal cortex that establishes this early memory. Both areas of the brain are required for this to happen. If the hippocampus wasn't there, it wouldn't be the retention of memory. If the frontal cortex was removed, there wouldn't be the retention of memory. You need them both. But then later on, the memory is in the frontal cortex only. It has moved or transformed. That memory now isn't, you know, in the hippocampus, it's in the frontal cortex only. The hippocampus could be inactivated, much like mine was on that fateful day, and the memory would still remain. So here's a good example on how the passage of time with sleep causes a memory to be consolidated outside the hippocampus into other cortical areas of the brain. That's extremely important, and that's the reason why I remembered my wife Becky, our beautiful dogs, even when my hippocampus was restarting. Before we finish this section, however, I want to look in more detail of the memory as it synchronizes, you know, between the hippocampus and the frontal cortex, because it's very, very important to understand that not only memories move about, they might be transformed. In the experiment, we challenge human subjects with a fairly complicated mathematical task. We don't need to be concerned with the details of the arithmetic, but we do need to understand that there was a trick. There was a hidden pattern in this numerical task such that the final answer was predicted by the second number in the sequence. None of the subjects were told this. They were given a fairly complex numerical task to do. They had to proceed through the task, and then some were allowed to sleep on it. Others were not. 
then they were tested. The main point here is that nobody was told there was a shortcut to solve this challenge. If the subjects were allowed to sleep, 60% of the subjects reported that they gained insight and found the shortcut. This result is outstanding. It says that memories, as they consolidated, are subjected to abstraction. Hidden rules or patterns are brought out when the hippocampus and the frontal cortex interact. The frontal cortex is the one, you know, that is responsible for drawing out these rules as a function of sleep. So if your grandkids are cramming for tests, you might want to tell them, get some sleep, because neuroscience says they will be amazed at the kinds of insights and observations that their brain can come to when they let their brain sleep. So let's try to tie all of this together, use an example of the best way to squeeze toothpaste. Now, early in the stages of memory formation, the interaction has all the characteristics of a Proust story. It's rich, it's detailed, and it's autobiographical. You are remembering the sequence of things that happened to you. The hippocampal deals not only with the frontal cortex, but other areas of the brain. It's synchronizing, talking if you will, to several different areas of your cortex during the creation of that memory. As sleep occurs, the memory is consolidated. It moves to other parts of your brain. It is transformed as if to a totem pole. Elements are abstracted. Rules are evaluated. Insight is gained. The autobiographical, the you part of the memory, may well decrease, and the memory goes from a proof story to a totem pole abstraction, squeeze from the bottom. Abstraction has an evolutionary benefit. It gives you the rules of the road and much less space. And if you're going to learn new stuff, you need the space in the brain. Additionally, by moving the memory into many areas of the cortex, you protect the memory. The hippocampus could go haywire, like mine did, but you'd still retain the memory and totem pole. Proust has become a totem pole. So let's get to Homer's take. Homer is ecstatic. He says sleep is important as it forms long-term memories. Yay, sleep. As you know, Homer loves sleep. Now he's going to think that his sleep is justified by neuroscience. Homer has an additional point. The point is hippocampal plus cortex interactions create totem poles. It abstracts information. It creates insightful observations, depending on the capabilities of the animal's brain. I think Homer, well, Homer has pretty well nailed it. These are the amazing properties of sleep and the formation of memories. In our last section, we take a look at memory manipulation. Is it possible to alter or modify memories? And would that be a good or ethical thing? I think we agree that there's some types of manipulation that are not ethical. Erasing the memory of an innocent bystander, for example. Mother Nature has given us memory to remember unpleasant situations for a good reason, so we don't repeat them. However, if we have the ability to alter the emotional content of a memory, would that be a good thing if it improved the life of an individual? As an example, let's take anxiety disorders. These disorders are very common. They affect the millions of lives in the United States and all over the world. They, they reflect intense emotional dysfunction from soldiers returning from a tour of duty, irrational fears of animals or heights, dysfunction associated with abusive relationships or instances of rape. 30% of our spending in the United States goes to some form of anxiety disorders. The cost to the economy is significant. Over $45 billion are spent trying to alleviate the suffering that comes from anxiety disorders each year. If we could separate the emotional dysfunction from those memories, would that not be a good thing? Would that not be a good thing to use the technology and understanding we've investigated today? Let's take a look. The example I want to use is PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. It occurs in soldiers returning from a tour of duty and is thought to dramatically involve overgeneralization. By that I mean there's a memory of the combat experience which has a significant sensory element, say some kind of burning wreckage. After returning home, the soldier experiences something that's similar, say a backyard fire pit, and there's an overgeneralization. It causes the recall of the combat experience. We've seen how the hippocampus can jump to conclusions and perform something called pattern completion, 
One explanation of a PTSD sufferer's brain is that their hippocampus cannot distinguish between the elements of the sensory experience and the for, you know from the former soldier is thrust back into the intense emotion of combat by experiencing an inoffensive cue. Someone with a healthy hippocampus uh, pattern completion can separate those two environments. The backyard fire pit is a context separate from the combat experience. And this former soldier, there's not an overgeneralization. There's not an intense emotional dysfunction associated with contact with everyday experiences like backyard fire pits. How can we go about relieving the symptoms of this debilitative and debilitating anxiety disorder? Well, one way is it turns out you know, you can do that by growing new cells in the hippocampus. In a normal hippocampus, we do grow new cells throughout the course of our life, about 40,000 a day. Now, that sounds like a lot, you know, but it's not much when you think we got 86 billion in there already. But this process is called neurogenesis and it occurs in very few parts of the brain. However, stress has an adverse effect on the growth of new cells. Combat experience is the textbook definition of stress. So from exposure to combat, we probably have a decline in the growth of new cells. But many events can increase the growth of new cells in the hippocampus. The passage of time, certain kinds of anti-anxiety drugs, electroconvulsive shock, exercise, and meditation can all have positive effects on the growth of new cells within the hippocampus. Now the time course is noted on the bottom right of this slide. It takes about two to six weeks for this kind of treatment to result in the acceleration of new cell growth. That matches the time course of psychotropic drugs in terms of when they can have an effect on the behavior of PTSD sufferers. This is a new insight and originates from research completed quite recently. The research extends our understanding of how PTSD involves a lack of discrimination of context, and it gives us hope that with various avenues of treatment, we can alleviate the emotional dysfunction that comes from this anxiety disorder. There are also new therapeutic avenues for treating anxiety disorders, which utilize the fact that the hippocampus is always learning. Because of that fact, we can combine non-fear memories with fear memories of the past to reduce emotional content. For example, a soldier suffering from PTSD can recollect fear memories in an environment of measured breathing, of general wellness of the body, etc. As this new memory is consolidated, those fear memories are going to be intermixed with non-fear memories. That means we can use inexpensive, non-invasive techniques, not drugs, not electroconvulsive shock, but we can reduce the future anxiety of fear memories by coupling them with non-fear memories. This is a wonderful avenue of therapeutic approach. It deals with meditation. It deals with exercise. It's an exciting area of research that we'll hear more and more about in the future but it also has implications that it's a memory, that a memory is really the last retrieval of an event, not the original event. If I'm asked to recollect an event that happened long ago, I'm not going to get the original memory of the event. I'm going to get the memory as it's been recollected over time and coupled with all the other context when I was recollecting. That has implications for eyewitness testimony in our legal system, especially as it relates to events far away in time. Our legal system is grappling, grappling with such effects. Neuroscience can inform those discussions, but new legal scenarios need to be envisioned for what we now know to be the complex dimensions of memory and its transformation in your brain. There's news on this front from here at UT. The Drew Lab in the Department of Neuroscience has published breakthrough research on the nature of memory. The memory that allows a behavior to cease is a separate memory from that which allows a behavior to be expressed. In other words, absence of a behavior does not mean there's no memory of what led to that behavior. This is very important to the treatment of PTSD and other forms of mental decline. It offers hope that memories may be recovered even when behaviors seem to indicate the memory is gone. Let's take a look at this using Pavlovian conditioning. Recall that in this kind of behavior, an animal reacts to a stimulus, say a bell, which predicts food with the same type of behavior they associate with the food itself, in other words, salivation. There's a unique memory in the hippocampus for this decision to act. But what if we decide to stop delivery of food after the bell? 
Well, ultimately, the salivation behavior stops. The animal does not react to the bell as they do to food, and this situation is called extinction. Based on the work of the Drew Lab at UT, we now know that extinction is underpinned by a new memory. It overrides the memory of conditioning and stops a behavior. But the original memory is not gone. It can come back with the passage of time. So it's not erased from the brain. This means that the two memories contend for control of behavior. Recall in seminar two when we learned that the basal ganglia ex arbitrated this action. There's a go-no-go no go system in the brain controlling this. So if we want to minimize a fear response in PTSD training, we want to ensure an extinction memory is strong and maintained, and we need to keep reinforcing it to maximize the retention of PTSD behavior. Now I want to emphasize a point here. No behavior does not equal no memory. It is typically dueling memories associated with the hippocampus. If we are treating behavior that looks like memory loss, we do not need to give up hope. The memory may still be there. It's just being overridden by another memory that we need to address. This is an exciting result, and more research will be fascinating, especially in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Last time for Homer today. Homer says, your mom was right. You should face your fears with support. By bringing up your fears in a safe, non-fear environment, one can alter the competition of the context of that memory. That is a potent way to assist you know, addressing disorders. This technique is improved with meditation and exercise. I think that's important as we deal with anxiety disorders and other syndromes affecting large portions of society. And on that point, Homer would like to emphasize, why don't you also try exercise and meditation? It is amazing the amount of scientific data that is coming out to support exercise and meditation for the beneficial effects on the hippocampus and on the brain in general and on the body in general. We will look at this in more detail in Seminar 6. The final point Homer wants to make is always remember that stopping a behavior is new learning. So when a behavior is not shown, it may not be because the memory is gone. We may be able to recover the memory, and that gives us hope for those that are dealing with cognitive decline. We'll deal more with this again in Seminar 6. This concludes Seminar 3, The Structure of Memory. I hope you enjoyed the seminar. In Seminar 4, we'll begin to look at the question of what is really so unique about the human brain. Up to now, we've talked about the basic brain processes similar among most animals of the mammal world. In Seminar 4 and 5, we'll explore the uniqueness of the human brain when compared to primate species. We'll see some fairly surprising results. For example, how the search for bananas in the forest of Africa set the shape of your brain. That brain shape set the stage for the right-hand part of this diagram a sculpture of the itinerant Japanese um, sage, Kuya, who lived in the 10th century. No animal other than a human could produce the right-hand part of this slide, but no human would have emerged without the left-hand part of this slide. I look forward to you joining me on this fascinating journey. This is Steve Solwick.